find a way. Alright. The Honourable Yang Dr. Ahmad Mulia Tunku Datuk Dr. Hajar Sofa Jewa, Founder of the Tun Sufyan Foundation, Trustees of the Tun Sufyan Foundation, and our very Associate Professor Dr. Johan Samsudin bin Haji Sabarudin, the Dean of the Faculty of Law, University of Malaya. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to everyone. And welcome to the Tun Sufyan International Human Rights Moot Court Competition 2017. We thank you all for gracing this very special occasion with us today. My name is Ashley and I'm the MC for today's event. We are delighted to welcome all participants to our faculty and we extend the warmest welcome to those who have traveled from distance. Two years ago, an inaugural Tun Sufyan Constitutional Moot Court Competition was held in UM at the national level to bring law students from different institutions nationwide to broaden their experience as well as to sharpen their mooting skills. This year, the Tun Sufyan Foundation and University of Malaya have decided to bring it up a notch to an international level this time to strengthen our ties and to gather participants from across countries through mooting. I would now like to invite the director of this event, Mr. Adam Tayong Wei, to come up on stage for a few words. A very good morning and a warm welcome to the founder, Yang Teramat Mulia Tunku Dr. Sofia Jewa, trustees of the Tun Sufyan Foundation, dean of the Faculty of Law, associate professor Dr. Johan Shamsuddin bin Haji Sabaruddin, 
distinguished guests, delegates, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Adam Tai, the director of the organizing committee of the Tun Sufian International Human Rights Moot Court Competition. First of all, thank you for joining us in the opening ceremony of the inaugural Tun Sufian International Human Rights Moot Court Competition. We are honored and delighted to have you here. The Tun Sufian Foundation was established in 2002 in memory of Tun Sufian, and since then, the Foundation has been actively promoting the constitutional values advocated by Tun Sufian. The Foundation has successfully organized many public lectures and also a national level MOOC com competition called the Tun Sufian Constitutional MOOC Court Competition, which was held last year. This year, the Tun Sufian Foundation decided to bring the competition to the international level and therefore have extended invitation to uh, Tarumanagara Uni University from Indonesia, Tamasa University from Thailand, Ateneo de Manila University from Philippines, East China University of Science and Technology from China, Kyushu University from Japan, National University of Singapore, and lastly from Malaysia, both University Islam Antarabangsa and also University of Malaya. As the name suggests, this year's MOOC com competition will be based on international human rights law. This event seeks to provide a platform for law students to widen their experience as well as to improve their mooting skills. Being at an international level, this competition also allows students from different institutions to learn from one another and at the same time make friends and strengthen ties between universities from different countries. So I would like to express my gratitude to the Dean, Dr. Johan, for his kindness, support and trust in our committee member throughout our preparation for the competition. I would also like to thank the Tun Sufian Foundation for giving us the opportunity to be in charge of handling this event. And lastly, I would like to thank the following donors whom ha have donated a substantial amount to ensure that this competition has enough funding. Our deepest appreciation to Yang Babagia Dato Sri Gopal Sri Ram, who have donated 30,000 ringgit. Yang Babagia Tan Sri Muhammad Shafi Abdullah, who has don donated 10,000 ringgit. Puan Haniza Zaharuddin, who is present here, uh, had donated 10,000 ringgit. Dr. Li Chi Peng has purchased uh, books from the Tun Sufian Foundation of the value 4,000 ringgit. Yang Berbahagia Dato Asmi Muhammad Ali has donated 3,000 ringgit. Mr. Chui Moon Shao has donated 2,000 ringgit. Mr. Tommy Thomas also 2,000 ringgit. Tun Saleh Abbas has donated 1,000 ringgit. Tunku Farid Ismail has donated 500 ringgit. Mr. A.G. Kalidas, the chairman of the Selangor Bar Committee, has donated 500 ringgit. And last, uh, Dr. Kernail Singh has purchased books worth of uh, 400 ringgit. And lastly, but by no means the least, I would like to acknowledge a special thanks to a 16 year old, year old girl by the name of Putri Fateh Arena, the granddaughter of the founder, Tunku Sofia Jewa whose book, Parakosm, a publication of the Tun Sufian Foundation, has contributed a sum more than any of, the, any of the donors for this event. And I do hope that at a special price of only 20 ringgit for today only, every participant will make it a point to purchase this book and bring it home. And we are actually selling this book in, in the book counter by the, uh, in front of the foyer. So it is the Foundation's hope that at least uh, every participant would purchase and bring it home to their uh, country. So, and of course, I would like to thank my committee members who have been working very hard towards this competition. And on behalf of my committee, I warmly welcome you all again and hope you have an enjoyable stay here. May this year's competition be a great success. Thank you. invite the Dean, Dr. Johan, up on stage for a speech. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Yang terima kasih, Tunggu Dr. Dr. Sofian Jewa, and Dr. Dr. Yaakob Bankan, founder trustees of the Tun Sofian Foundation. Members of the Board of Trustees, Tun Sofen Foundation, Pon Aniza, who is a donor, is here present this morning. 
academic from the Faculty of Law, University of Malaya, and uh, academic from other universities, associate deans and vice deans from other universities. Uh, so, Dada Adam Tai, director of the Tons of Fan Mooting Competition. Participating teams, distinguished guests, the law students, ladies and gentlemen. This is not just a moot competition. This is a tribute to one of Malaysia's greatest judge and jurists. We at the faculty and the Tons of Fan Foundation are proud that this competition has evolved to international status, fulfilling the aspiration of the founder trustees and the The competition at the domestic level is based on constitutional law, while its international version is based on human rights law, both laws being the passion of Allah Yaham Tun Muhammad Sofian Hashim. Humility, compassion, far-sightedness, and fierce independence mark the career of our former Chief Justice, or Lord President, as he was then known as. His judgments remain true to our constitution. He was a judge at the time when the judiciary would independently protect the rule of law and fundamental rights. He had a deep insight into the working of the constitution and its mechanism to protect its Bill of Rights. One of his quotations which I find most reflective of this was when he wrote in 1979, and I quote, during our limited experience, we have found that the contents of the Constitution are important, but more important is the spirit of the men at the top, whose duty is to carry out its provisions. Do they believe in the independence of the judiciary and the values of a strong bar, incorruptible and fearless? If they do, then the Constitution is viable, and there is hope and future for the country. But if they are rogues or charlatans, determined only to satisfy their own personal and family ambitions, regardless of the wider interests of the nation, then the country will head towards the abyss. No matter how long and hard its founding fathers labored to write the most nearly perfect constitution in the world. End of quote. I must admit that these words resonate ever so loudly until this very day and permeates into the realm of international human rights law as well. The son of Akali, Don Muhammad Sofian, was born in a remote village in the state of Perak in 1917. He read law at Cambridge on a Queen's scholarship and was called to the bar in 1941. At the outbreak of the Second World War, he joined All India Radio in New Delhi. After the conflict, he returned to London where he joined the BBC. Appointed to the Malayan Civil Service, he was posted to Malacca as magistrate and harbour master. A curious appointment justified on the grounds that while there was no provision for a magistrate's salary, there was one for the master of the harbour. He joked that he was a kind of a sea lawyer. In 1959, Tun Muhammad Sofian became Malaysia's first citizen general and two years later, a high court judge. In 1973, he became Chief Justice of Malaya, or what is known today as Chief Judge of Malaya, and in the following year, became Lord President or what is known today as Chief Justice of Malaysia. It is most significant today that we are officiating the Tun Muhammad Sofian International Moot Court competition here at his auditorium. When Tun Muhammad Sofian came here to officiate the naming of this auditorium, I remember him remarking in his speech that no one had ever named anything after him and how happy and proud he was that day that we chose to name this auditorium after him. I remember how we were overcome with emotion at this point. He had also said, and I quote, I hope that I shall be remembered as a man who was fair and just, both within and without the courtroom, and as a man who has given back to the community, something in return for the great deal he has received from them, unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand here humbled at this pronouncement, and I say with conviction, that indeed we have remembered him as he had wished because he deserved entirely to be remembered in this way. Today, I speak to you on behalf of both the Faculty of Law, University of Malaya as Dean and the Ton Sofen Foundation as a trustee. We have decided to collaborate in organizing this moot competition with its prestigious name. Firstly, to carry on the legacy of Ton Muhammad Sofen in the area of law and education of which he was a passionate advocate of. 
The Tun Sofian Foundation under the wisdom and guidance of its founding trustees, Yang Terlamat Mulia, Tunku Datuk Dr. Sofian Jewa and Datuk Dr. Yaakob Pusin American, who both showed and displayed angelic characteristics in caring for Tun Sofian during his time of need in the remaining months of his life, have shown great generosity in pursuing the course of education. The faculty and the foundation have always had an excellent working relationship, and this moot court competition is further proof of that. This year, the competition is conducted at the international level with teams from uh, Kyushu University, Tamasat University, East China University of Science and Technology, National University of Singapore, Universitas Taramanagara from Indonesia, and Ateneo de Manila University from the Philippines, and the University of Malaya and the International Islamic University. On behalf of the faculty and foundation, I would like I would like to welcome all the teams and the academic staff members and coaches to this year's international competition. I hope all the particip participating teams will enjoy the competition and our hospitality. We thank the teams that have travelled great distances to come and participate in this competition. I would like to thank our sponsors who uh, was mentioned by, uh, by Adam just now, but because we're so thankful, I'm going to repeat their names again. Yang bahagia Dr. Sri Gopal Sri Ram, bahagia Tan Sri Muhammad Syafi Abdullah, Puan Haniza Zaharudin, Dr. Lee Chi Peng, yang bahagia Dr. Azmi Ma'ali, Mr. Chumin Mansu, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Tommy Thomas, yang membahagia Tun Sari Abbas, who was our former Lord President, yang membahagia Tun Kufari Ismail, Mr. Ak Khalidah, Chairman of the Selangor Bar Committee, and Dr. Tanel Singh who have donated generously towards this competition. My appreciation also goes to the foundation members, the academic and general staff of the Faculty of Law, University of Malaya, Sadara Adam Tai, and his tremendously hard-working committee members, who have with great enthusiasm pulled this competition together. Thank you so much. May we all have a very successful competition. Thank you. Presentation on the Tun Sufyan Foundation prepared by our very student committee.
Now, may I have everyone in the auditorium together in the middle column for a group photo to commemorate this event. Thank you. Please join us in the front two rows. and I work as a senior international case counsel with the Kuala Lumpur Regional Center for Arbitration. Um, and this is a colleague of mine, Ms. Rebecca Peng. Um, she works as, a, as an associate with the Herbert Smith Free Hills, but we are colleagues for the Young Practitioners Group, which we just established in March this year. And Young Practitioners Group is aimed at students and young practitioners under the age of 40. So we are here today, and first of all, of course, we would like to thank Tun Sufian Foundation uh, Law School of the University of Malaya and Organizing Committee. Thank you so much for putting so much effort into organizing this event and inviting us as judges and speakers. We are very thankful. So, um, yeah, and we would like to cover brief, very briefly the things we actually do for students and for young practitioners in Kuala Lumpur. And our projects, they aim not only at Malaysian law students, but also international law students. Um, yeah. Sorry, we're just waiting for... <laughs> okay, and... Um, okay, Rebecca, you may start. So Rebecca will tell you about our Young Practitioners Group, and Rebecca is a committee member of the uh, International Commercial Arbitration Committee. Hello everyone. Um, as you can see from this photo, this is the general perspectives of practice in arbitration. It's all male, pale and still. Uh, there's no woman but there's two ladies standing here today on behalf of KRCA. And this is one of the reasons that why um one of the purpose that KRCA and YPG want to serve, to bring diversity to the practice. The KRLCA YPG is a platform for ADL under the KRL, um, we are founded under the KRLCA and our target members is practitioner under 40 but including students. So as long as you are students or under 40, then you can join us. Uh, it took us about half a year to prepare the, the whole KRLCA YPG fund. And then these are the general events that we have done since the day we proposed the YPG to the director of the KRLCA. And the aim of the KRLCA YPG is to provide, what, what do we provide is education, opportunity for young practitioners and students who are interested in arbitration and ADR, and also to promote and educate ADR to people who are not familiar with their practice, and personalize your experience in arbitrations with the YPG. And the structure of the YPG contains fields, com um, committees group. My, me, myself, I sit in the commercial arbitration group and can see this is why we call it like YPG is personalized. We have very specialized committee groups that will focus on different aspects of arbitration practice. Yeah, what do we offer is pretty clear. The best thing that we can offer is networking. We have like hundreds of members all around the world and it's one of the biggest in Malaysia and Asia. It and largest in Asia as well. So what we all what you can constantly get from the YPG is first activities, events and talks that you can attend to expand your network and also enhance your knowledge in ADR. 
as you can see, now we have currently we have 550, 517 members um, from all 27 jurisdictions. And we conduct a statistic upon registration of the member to identify their interests. As you can see, the highest interest of the members are in commercial arbitrations. And from this statistic, we will take into consideration what kind of events that we should organize and how do we personalize the experience for the YPG member. Uh, these are one of the past events that we organized. It's the, we call it organized with the Young Fractional Group of CX, Singapore International Arbitration Commercial Center. And yeah, this is another event that we organized with the I ICC Young Fractional Group. Why would you want to join YPG? First is to expand your knowledge in international arbitration because most of the law school we do not they do not offer ADR as a core subject, and some of the law school doesn't even offer ADR as an elective subject. And through the YPG, if you want to enhance and expand your knowledge in ADR other than what you learn in law school, this is a platform for you. And you can meet top practitioners. Nowadays, it's not that difficult to meet the dream or say the idol of your career anymore through networking events or platform like YPG, you can always meet someone that you really admire and speak to them and get their experience and tips on your practice. And also, of course, to build your skills and career with us. And yeah, it's a repetitive. Okay, um, these are the general results that what we have done throughout the one year formations of the YPG. We are the largest group of ADR practitioners and students in Malaysia. Um, we have like huge crowd for our events, over 150 people. Um, we have individual success stories of young members. We organize or we help to connect students or young practitioners to get international internship abroad and also representing Malaysia on the World Students Forum in Russia. Thank you, and Tatiana will continue to talk about the pre mood that Carol Zia is going to organize and also the conference in March. Thank you very much, Rebecca. How many of you have ever heard about the William V. Smoot about the uh, international commercial arbitration? Have you participated? You should. <laughs> So, um, William C.V. Smoot is basically aimed at students who are interested in um, international commercial arbitration. And the idea to organize this Smoot, um, it was, yeah, it appeared like 25 years ago in Vienna by people who worked for uh, UNCITRAL, United Nations Commission for International Trade Law. And just because this Smoot is so successful, it's so large and prestigious, they expanded to Hong Kong. And all arbitral institutions worldwide, they um, help this moot by organizing practice rounds. So starting from this year, we we organizing pre moot here in, KL, uh, in at KLRC in collaboration with the ICC, International Chamber of Commerce, and in particular in collaboration with the uh, International Court of Arbitration under the ICC. So the next. Remote will take place from the 2nd to 4th of March here at KLRCA. The deadline for registration for the pre moot is the 31st January 2018. For the moot itself, the deadline will expire at the end of this month, so you can still go to international rounds, either to either Vienna or Hong Kong, but you need to register before the end of this month. Um, <laughs> For our pre moot just because we are trying to involve as many Malaysian students as possible, we don't require them to participate in international rounds in Vienna and Hong Kong, uh, just to, to, to share this international experience here in Malaysia, and then we will sponsor the best Malaysian team for international rounds. For instance, the best Malaysian team this year, in March 2017, was International Islamic University of Malaysia, and um, in March 2018, they are traveling to Vienna for international rounds, and KLRC is sponsoring them. 
also there is no registration fee for our pre-mode and uh, we also support international teams. If you are interested, teams from Singapore and any, uh, any other countries, we, we can sponsor accommodation in Kuala Lumpur during the days of the pre-mode here. And speaking of coaching of the Malaysian teams, in March this year we have 17 Malaysian teams out of 36 in total and we were helping all of them to prepare for the pre -mode. We opened our library, we invited our case council to assist with the re uh, not research but uh, to prepare for the oral hearings etc. So if you're interested this year even more practitioners from Malaysia are interested to participate as coaches and to help you. And in particular, Rebecca is interested to be a coach this year. So uh, just contact us. We are, yeah, we, we are very easy accessible. So if you're interested and if you need help, please let us know. Okay. Yeah, and this is some advantages. Why, as Malaysian and international students, you can participate and you should participate in the pre uh, Malaysian students, they can get this international exposure here at home, not traveling abroad. We are bringing international arbitrators to uh, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, also, you will, of course, improve your written and oral boxing skills, and so on. I mean, you know all these things. It's for every event. Um, and these are the prizes we give. The best team overall, and you can see on the photo, of, um, this is the best team from India. The best team gets 1,000 US dollars. Also, best speakers, they get paid internships with KLRCA, which is usually three months. And for best Malaysian team, as I mentioned, we sponsor the best Malaysian team to go to either Vienna or Hong Kong. Uh, yeah, and as we organize, we have a very big event here in, in May. It's our annual ADR Alternative Dispute Resolution Week here. Um, we also give some passes free of charge for the best students, um, like top speakers from general rounds, etc. And of course, books and some other prizes. These are some photos from our pre -mode. It was attended by 300 plus people, 36 teams as I mentioned, and 117 arbitrators from all over the world, including Brazil, other Latin American countries, United States, European countries, and of course Asian jurisdictions, and even Russia. Um, and this is statistics this year. We already have 23 registered teams and we are only in November. We still have 3-4 months to go before the pre -mode. From Malaysia so far we have nine teams and these are some of the countries who already expressed their interest in participation. Um, yeah, and if you don't want to participate but you still want to help, you can always participate as, an, as a volunteer. Just let us know and drop an email. Um, also, just because it's important to disseminate knowledge and to educate students in Asia and all over the world even more about arbitration and alternative dispute resolution, we decided to organize the first Asian arbitration conference for students and young practitioners. And it will be, um, it will take place on the 1st March and the 2nd March, the a day before the pre mode and the second day of the, uh, of the pre mode. It's free of charge for all the participants and for all members of the young practitioners group. The first day uh, will be mostly for the uh, participants of the pre mode and also uh, there will be an event to celebrate 60th anniversary of the New York Convention. If you know, New York Convention is the most successful convention which exists in the world right now. It allows uh, to enforce arbitral awards in 157 states all over the world. So next year is a very big year for UNCITRAL and uh, we already negotiated that UNCITRAL, the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, will come to PLRCA and help us to organize this event for students. Yeah, and we will also have four sessions in different languages regarding the Belt and Road Initiative. If you know, this is a Chinese initiative which is a very uh, ambitious and um, expensive pro uh, uh, yeah, uh, project. So it involves 60 plus countries, so here we decided to organize an event, OVOR event, for young practitioners and there will be four simultaneous sessions in four different languages. And also, if you're interested in networking with other institutions such as ICC or ICDR, which is American Institute, we are bringing their representatives uh, from uh, different parts of the world and there will be an institutional session also on the 1st of March. And again, for students who want to participate only in the conference and who are non-Malaysians, we will provide accommodation free of charge. 
that's about all. I wish you best of luck. Please work hard, and it's very important that your success, you know, your success is also part of success of your nation, of your future employer, and yeah, everyone, basically. Thank you very much. Let us know if you have any questions. Thank you once again to Ms. Tatiana and Ms. Rebecca. We hope everyone benefited from the presentation and hopefully it sparked your interest in arbitration. Finally, now we'd like to invite the Dean, the Trustees, the VIPs and the faculty members to the foyer for a light breakfast while the participants remain in the auditorium. Because if it's precedent, is it clearly like in the comments? Precedent is like precedent. I mean, like that applying that law when there is this same fact and same. <laughs>
because they fall under the exceptions in Article 72A and 72B. Both the torture and assembly claim are admissible for a lack of due process. This satisfies the exception under Article 72A. The travel ban claim is also admissible because Diana was denied access to domestic remedies. And this satisfies the exception under Article 72B. So I will now take your Excellency's attention to the torture claim first. Okay, so what is it that, uh, how do we evidence the exception of 2A? Uh, sorry, Excellency, how do we... So the, because they denied the local remedies, we can see 2B. How do we see 2A? Oh, yes, Your Honour. Your Excellency, I will now show you how the torture claim has shown a lack of due process. Due process. So, uh, under 72A, if the complainant can prove this lack of due process, she does not need to exhaust domestic remedies. And what exactly does a lack of due process mean? The Inter-American Court of Human Rights has interpreted to mean that launching another claim at a domestic level will have no reasonable prospect of success. And this is the test. As a matter of policy, the international courts should be extremely slow to strike down claims at the admissibility level, especially in the context of protecting human rights. This is consistent with the very purpose for why these exceptions were created in the first place, which recognizes that when there is no reasonable prospect of success, it would be a senseless formality to force victims to exhaust all domestic remedies. In this case, in this case, did your client actually go ahead? They, she did not even bother to attempt, did she? She lost at the first level. Her complaints were dismissed at the first level. She didn't bother at all. Uh, even your, try. your Excellency, if we refer to the facts at paragraph 27 uh, and 28, what we actually see at 28 is that an appeal was filed right up to the Supreme Court of Mawaki. Yes. And this uh, and what this previous corpus application shows us is that one of the grounds for which she launches the claim was that her conditions of detention amounted to torture. And because this was a ground that was raised through right up to the Supreme Court, the final appellate court in Mawaki, and that they've already authoritatively ruled that there was no torture made out on the facts, that it would not make sense for to force Diana to launch a totally new claim in torture at the domestic courts again, because they've already ruled that there is no torture made out in Diana's case. Yeah, I want to stop you there, counsel. That matter that went up to the Supreme Court was in respect of a habeas corpus application, which was made on grounds that there was procedural non-compliance. Yes. There is no mention of torture. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, if we look at the facts at 27, yes. together yes. with the clarification of yes. human, yes. at clarification 27, mm -hmm. it states that there were three grounds for a habeas corpus application. Mm -hmm. So the first is what Your Excellency pointed out, which is that there was procedural non-compliance. The second ground was actually that the conditions of detention also amounted to torture. And the third is that it, the conditions of detention were inhumane. And so there were actually three grounds for which she raised the habeas corpus application. It was not just about procedural non-compliance. And thus, this proves that the domestic courts, the, high, the highest appellate court has already considered Diana's claim and have proved that there was no torture on the facts. And thus, her claim in torture should be admissible before this court. I will now take your Excellency's attention to the second claim about assembly and why this is likewise admissible for a lack of due process. A lack of due process has also been interpreted by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights to mean that the court has failed to examine the merits of the case. In the present facts, there are two key things that show us that the Milwaukee Court has failed to examine the merits of Diana's freedom of assembly claim. The first fact that the appellant would like to point out is the speed and haste with which her claim was dismissed. This can be seen at paragraph 35 of the facts. And to quote directly from this paragraph, your Excellency, take a look. The matter was in a rare mood, speedily heard. What this implies is that in cases of such nature, the court typically takes a longer time to come to a reasoned decision. And thus, it shows a dismissive attitude towards Diana's freedom of assembly claim. A second fact that the appellant would like to point out to the Excellency is that when the lawyers protested that they were only allowed one hour and that this amount of time was insufficient, the bare minimum the court should have done was to hear the lawyer's explanation out 
And thereafter, if they still felt that one hour was sufficient, they should have explained to the council why this was so. But instead of doing this, they unilaterally insisted that the matter be disposed of. And this can be seen at the last sentence of paragraph 35. And thus, we see that these two facts that I have pointed out highlights the dismissive attitude of the bar and court to get rid of a freedom of assembly claim as quickly as possible without examining the merits of a case. Thus, this also shows a lack of due process and thus, no freedom of assembly claim should at least be admissible to this court. I will now take your Excellency's attention to the last travel ban claim and why this claim is admissible as well. This is because Diana was denied to access to domestic remedies, which satisfies the exception under Article 7.2b. According to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights Advisory Opinion, a complainant will be deemed to have been denied access to domestic remedies where the remedies which are not afford these remedies and that because they were prohibitively costly. So are we, are we yes. bound by that decision? Are we bound by any ruling of that court you mentioned? Uh, Your Excellency, we submit that the Inter-American Court of Human Rights interpretation of all these articles are persuas very persuasive to this court. You're not bound by that? Yes, Your Excellency, we concede that we are not bound, but we submit on two bases that it is highly persuasive to this court. The first reason is because the American Convention of Human Rights has an article, which is Article 46, 1 and 2, which is in peri material to Article 7 of the treaty. The second reason as to why this is highly persuasive is because this court is a new court that has been established by ASEAN, and thus there is no previous jurisprudence for us to rely on. Thus, a, a, a treaty that is in peri material to us and has an interpretation will be highly persuasive out of necessity because there is no other case law for our own court that we can currently look at at this point in time. Should we also consider the cultural differences between the North Americans and South Asian countries? Uh, Your Excellency, we acknowledge that there are indeed differences between the American system in certain uh, ways compared to the ASEAN way, but we submit that these differences should not be material to the court for the reasons that I have mentioned above, which is that firstly, um, the the articles are in peri material, and second, that this is out of necessity, and because there is no other international court uh, treaty that we can turn to to give us advice. But more than that, as a matter of policy, the exceptions were created because we recognise that in certain exceptional circumstances, it would be futile to force complainants to exhaust domestic remedies where their own domestic court system is unable to provide them proper compensation. So. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency, for that question. And I will now bring you back to why, in the present case, this falls under uh, an exception under Article 7 to B, and how Diana was, in fact, denied access to domestic remedies. This is seen in the punitive costs that were imposed on the on Diana's claims at the High Court and the Court of Appeal. And because of this, there is no need for her to launch a further appeal. There are three key things that I would like to point out to the court. The first, at paragraph 38 of the facts, what we see is Diana saying that the monetary costs imposed on her were punitive in nature. This illustrates that the remedies, that the costs imposed on her significantly wore down her finances and made her unable to afford a further appeal. The second fact that we would like to point out is that she is part of a group of highly impecunious people in the Hawaiian state. If your excellencies take a look at paragraph 10 of the facts, what we see is that Hawaii is the second poorest state in Mawaki, even though it is rich in precious natural resources. These resources are exclusively mined by the Federation-owned company, and the profits are not trickling down to benefit the native Hawaiians. Furthermore, if we turn to the clarification document, and we see clarification 6. The average annual income of a Milwaukee adult is 26,000 Milwaukee dollars. This is equivalent to approximately 9,000 US dollars, which is far below the average worldwide annual income of 18,000 US dollars. Council, I have a question. In general, we should consider the average Milwaukee, or we should consider her as a standard for violations? Or for punitive costs? Uh, Your Excellency, 
Do you understand your concern? Combined use of five techniques, including 
Could you also, would you like to request for additional time? Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. And otherwise, you'll be penalized. Oh, okay. I ask you to share time? <laughs> Five minutes? Is that wrong? Five minutes for you to finish up the submission to sum up. Including street deprivation wanted to a practice of inhuman and degrading treatment. The appellate in this case at hand, Diana Rubel, was mentally exhausted by daily 12 hour long interrogations. After the interrogations, she remained exposed to 24 hour lighting, which made it very difficult, even for any ordinary person to have proper sleep. How do you determine severe pain or suffering? Or how do you determine it? Uh, is it a subjective assessment or is it an objective assessment that has to be made by a competent authority, i.e. a medical personnel or what? Uh, so I mean, different people have different levels of tolerance, so how do you determine this? Behind her. Behind her. The respondent never amounted to valid restrictions in their rights to see court. Allow me to establish this in detail in two points. On to the first point. Article 0.1 of the rights to see requires that a restriction must be necessary to protect national security of public order. Here, with respect to respondent's actions, it never amounted or were not necessary to protect national security of public order because of the following actions of respondent. First, respondent banned all rallies because of a supposedly potentially violent confrontation between Harbaugh 2.0 and the Indigo movement. However, according to the case of Traveler versus Hungary, the HHR there established the standard of a demonstrated risk of insecurity or disturbance. In this case, my lord, paragraph 19 shows that respondent never demonstrated such risk. It did not even provide supporting facts for such risk. Isn't it possible for two sides that sort of people on the street with uh, they would have some fighting Both sides are fighting all across. And the state are taking such a vote to ban such uh, constant incidents from happening. Isn't that so? My lord, no, it is not always the case that when there are two groups fighting for different advocacies, that there would be in the end that both groups would be uh, would be fighting with each other. Even then, my lord, in the case, even then, my lord, in the case of Alexeya versus Russia. The Human Rights Committee decided there that if there are potential risks of confrontations between two groups, it does not still amount to the, the valid uh, or a threat to national security or public order. So, hundreds of foreign shell protesters against a 40,000 individual shell protesters. 
once confrontations occur, how do you expect the state to control such incidents? And uh, I agree with uh, my little brother here. And I also wish to emphasize uh, that there's something to do with the problem. Uh, I told my one that after the police arrested uh, some of the protesters, there were 50 protesters fought with uh, some of the items. Would it not be possible that violence would, should uh, the public assembly be allowed to do? Your Lordships, allow me to answer your questions in turn. First, while we do admit that the facts show that there were 100,000 Arbogians and 40,000 members of the Indigo movement, still it would not be considered as a threat to national security or the public order. My Lord, while it may be possible or while confrontations may possibly occur, my Lord, it is the op my Lord, allow me to uh, allow me to direct you the facts in the case. When respondent imposed or decided to ban all rallies, there was no confrontation yet. It may be the right or the obligation of the state when such confrontations would presently and actually occur. Would it not be better to do that than to allow violence to occur? My Lord, it must be taken into, into consideration, as in the case of Alexei versus Russia, the human rights committee considered there that the primary obligation of the state is first and foremost to facilitate such assemblies. While it may be the case of a balancing of interest between the rights, individual rights and the rights of the uh, general public, the state must first determine those lesser or lesser actions which are less restricted. Moreover, my dear, as to your question, allow me to direct you with paragraph 20 of the supplement which shows that most of the hard bodies deny any cause to bring weapons. And even if there would be people who would be found bringing in weapons, the special, according to Special Rapporteur Marina Kai, it is mentioned that the state is only required to arrest those persons who brought in weapons. How does the state go and find out one or two out of a hundred Orange protesters that have uh, life? Is this impossible? How do you, you propose that on your side? I would say, of course, I'm going to ban You refer back to paragraph 20, line 4, line. Furious speeches were made on both sides. Supplemental facts from paragraph 20. And 2, he says that they are nine compromised and skilled parts. One of the professors might take the knife and just, you know, uh, slap someone and just slap. You know, 100 something, 140 something people are going to fight. Would it be better to stick to this ban under section 50? It's legal under the law, right? My lord, I do understand your concern because of the large number of protesters, but allow me to direct you with other facts in this case.
according to the article of Manila, the ICCPR, as the agent has said, stated before, there should be no restrictions that may be placed on the exercise of this body, unless it is necessary in the interest of national security, public order, public health, public morals, or the protections and rights and freedoms of others. For instance, the restrictions condition is not proven since the rally did not threaten the national security of our body. As the agent has stated before, the rally was only meant to demand the sovereignty of our world over its natural wealth and resources not a succession of The right to self-determination itself is proclaimed in numerous UN resolutions and Article 1 of the ICCPR and the ICDS. Um, in addition, the national security and territorial integrity will only be threatened by some act of violence. For example, actual terrorist activity or genocide. For instance, therefore, the rally did not threaten the national security of Hawaii as the rally did not mean U.S. deception, and it is not a uh, threat to the, the national security, it is not a terrorist activity, nor a genocide. But, um, so how do you explain that previous rally run by the same people has caused stampedes and death? For instance, the last and the before rally for the Hall, before this rally, it is, does not share the same view as the uh, as the man, the meaning of the view, uh, the meaning of the rally is different. This one is about sovereignty of our own. In, in the allied articles, let's just say it could be something very secret, very secret, you know. But yet, in the national security, be with the police forces, the police special branch, and all the other things. So, the Ministry of Home Affairs, or the Ministry of Home Affairs, and the police and the others, the less information which you and I won't have. Okay, they won't have. So, when they have the information, if they feel they have to retain this person for preventive action, that will no death in the event occur. Okay, maybe the intelligence you know, today they are planning to carry out uh, they say a riot. So even I don't know the information you know. It is only accessible to the minister and then to the police forces for the property leaders. And section 15 of that the act, it provides according to law. So what I think they've done, they've done to get attention. Go ahead. Don't worry. Yeah, says, the preventive detention or the uh, deprivation of liberty is allowed. However, it is not allowed if it is an arbitrary arrest. It will be a deliberate delivery of the submission. You know, the agent is something right now. Thank you. Second, the rally did not threaten the public order. For instance, the Brazilian may argue that the rally caused disturbance to the public order or threatened the public order. According to clarifications by the final one, the fact that 15 out of 100,000 protesters were caught for possessing humble items, according to compromise part of the final view, still the rally was really peaceful. For instance, according to the case Chester versus France, European Commission stated that to determine whether a demonstration is peaceful, it is considered from the intentions of the organizers and the participants. In addition, absences, categorization as a non-peaceful assembly is not determined by a violation of a small by a small number of participants. References violence by a small number of participants shall not automatically lead to the categorization as the assembly is not. Therefore, since the intentions of the rally itself is peaceful, and the rally was related to peaceful, therefore the rally did not threaten and nor cause disturbance to the public order. For the third point, the, the state of our walk is called the one person caused his advantages to Diana. For instance, Diana was arrested on the 10th of February 2016 at 12 30 hours by the police personnel, handcuffed and brought in a custody to the special power. For instance, the rest of the review that the arrest is made against Diana is in accordance with international law. However, if we refer to Article 9, Section 1 of the ICCPR, everyone has the right to liberty and security of person. No one shall be subject to the arbitrary arrest or detention. However, says, as to the principle of legality, it is a violation if an individual is arrested or detained on grounds which are not clearly established in the domestic legislation. Council Article 9 also mentioned that no one is deprived of liberty except it is a qualified uh, clause as well in accordance with such procedures established by law. Now, do you think that the state of morality has no 
not done what is necessary under the law, the procedure. The article says, this piece of the public act is for the article says, the agent would like to find this court to revert paragraph 7 of the compromise. According to the uh, report published by the police of Milwaukee, wording the piece of public act is ambiguous and open to abuse. It is ambiguous, sir, because it is not clearly stated in the legal, uh, in the national, in the national lawyer. It is only ambiguous. It's not, it is not clearly stated. Therefore, but but Article 22 of the SPSC is that the kind of better regulations can be at the safety from the order. What provider under 21 can be denied? Yes, sir, uh, it's right. That is qualified, right? Pointed out, and we agree 
this is a situation of political tension between two parties, one that's trying to succeed. So while we submit that the travel ban was adequate and was necessary, the way in which the travel ban should be put across to the public is something of a sensitive nature, and the timing of the ban is something that has to be given due consideration, due regard. Therefore, because of the situation in which this case is in, we see that the case is complex and it warrants the court spending more time and more effort on the case. Therefore, as a reflection of this time and effort taken by the courts, by the courts such a cost of $80,000, $50,000 at the court of High Court, $30,000 at the court of Appeal is warranted. If I could move on then to, my, to the claim three, which is the claim that one hour of submission was insufficient. Uh, there are two parts to the appellant's contention. First, it has a precedence, and second of all, that there is no time for submissions, and if I will deal with both these issues in order. The appellant's contention that a precedent would prevent the Moroccan Supreme Court from coming to an alternative conclusion of Diana's right of peaceful assembly is flawed as a matter of law. Given that Moroccan uses a common law system, the Moroccan su Supreme Court is capable of overruling itself and is not bound by previous decisions, unlike the lower courts. As the appellant has rightfully pointed out in the memorial of page 3, the Moroccan judiciary is a competent authority. Thus, an appeal to the Moroccan Supreme Court for claim 4 would afford the Supreme Court the opportunity to look at the merits of the case and overrule the previous challenge immediately. The Moroccan Supreme Court is also not bound by precedent because the issue that was decided in the 2012 decision is on two separate matters. The 2012 issue is an issue of constitutionality of the section, while the current appeal is whether the ban that Diana is under restricts her right of freedom of movement and is therefore an application of a piece of legislation that the court has deemed to be constitutional. Moving on to the rebuttal that one hour was insufficient to make submissions, as a matter of policy, just because a, there is an objection from Diana's lawyers as to the time given for the submission does not mean that the timing was inadequate. If such an objection would amount to an incomplete hearing, no hearing would ever be complete as lawyers would constantly measure the court for more time until they reach a decision that is agreeable to them. It is the responsibility as well as the discretion of the court to ascertain the time required for submission and to appropriately allocate the time as need be. Furthermore, the courts have shown that where the matter would take a longer time to submit and for delibera del deliberation, they have allowed a longer time for the appellant's counsel, as seen at the clarification in paragraph 32, where Diana's lawyers made submissions from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. and were not restricted by any time frame. So therefore, we have shown that claims 3 and 4 are inadmissible because she has failed to approach the Supreme Court of Iraqi. If I could just go back very quickly to claim 2, that on torture, I would like to show how that as well is inadmissible. Diana has no standing for claim 2 because she has not approached any Moroccan court with a complaint of torture. The appellant contended earlier that the Habeas Corpus application submitted by Diana's lawyers brought the issue of torture in substance before local authorities and given that the competent Moroccan authority had already examined Diana's complaint in substance, Diana exhausted all her local remedies. We beg to differ. As a matter of law, Habeas Corpus literally means to produce the body and it's a procedural application to the court for the prisoner to be brought before the courts to contest the initial grounds of incarceration. Habeas corpus is not a substantive application to the courts for relief against torture. By arguing that the claim of torture was heard by the Moroccan courts in substance, the appellant has essentially completed two fundamentally different processes, one on procedure and one in of substantive substance. The authorities for whether Habeas corpus can be used to test the legality of conditions of confinement are eager, but all of them tend to say that the habeas corpus cannot be used for such a purpose. As a matter of policy, it can be seen that the court's motivation to restrict the writ of habeas corpus is in line with the potential indeterminate expansion of the writ to include grounds for claims of intimidation, negligence, conspiracy, and so forth. Expanding habeas corpus to include substantive claims would thus uh, result in an unruly writ that would be open to abuse. On the facts, given that the appellants have also conceded that habeas corpus might not be the most appropriate remedy for torture, and as I've established earlier, they are correct to have conceded as such, this court should find that domestic remedies for the appellant's claim of torture has not been exhausted and that Diana has no standing. International bodies determine whether torture has occurred by considering the nature of the act or acts involved, the severity which are the nature of the act or acts involved, and the severity of the physical and or mental health suffered as Mr. Marwaki has committed several acts which they considered as torture. 
These acts are the questioning of Diana for 5 hours a day and her for turning on the light for 24 hours. However, the agents submit that none of these acts are constituted as a torture. With regard to the first act, prolonged interrogation may lead to sleep deprivation. However, as it takes up to 20 hours session interrogation to be considered as a prolonged interrogation. Even if the appellant insists that it is a prolonged interrogation, there is no...
The diagnosis was also made on Diana is still under information in ongoing stress. With regard to the diagnosis of malnutrition, disorientation, and hallucination, the agents submit that it is a result of Diana's own act to exercise a hunger strike. Moreover, Marok has also provided an effective means of preventing the act of torture, as regulated under Article 2, Article A of the United Nations Convention against Torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment of punishment. Effective measures means a measure that provides safeguards during detention. In this case, Marok has provided effective measure to prevent the act of torture by providing Diana with a sanitary and well ventilated cell and with bags, and also provide her with books and reading materials. Moreover, she was also allowed to perform her daily religious training. Maroki has also provided Diana the access to the lawyer, which is viewed as a procedural guarantee to safeguard against torture by the European Court of Human Rights in the case of Saldus versus Turkey. This act is undeniable proof that Maroki has no intention to commit an act of torture and has taken effective measure to prevent an act of torture.
that loves organizing or participating the assembly in penetrious violence. The ICCPR only protect the assembly that are peaceful. Thank mm-hmm. you. 
the conformity with the law. Second, the restrictions are necessary to protect the national security. National security refers to situations involving an immediate and violent threat to the nation. National security may be invoked to justify restrictions when they are taken to protect the existence of the nation or as no deterrence effect. However, the facts do not provide anything on this, and indeed, as accepted um, in the practice of states, uh, the award payment generally takes effect immediately, and uh, further, the agent fails to take into account that a deterrence effect on the whole ethnic community, uh, as affirmed in the Nikajala Nikajala paper before the Human Rights Committee. There's, uh, the respondent stated that the torture shall take into account of every circumstance, and that due to concern of national security, it should widen the scope of question to include the threat of family. Uh, however, uh, the appellant argued this on no legal basis, and indeed such threat of family, uh, of threat of family members' life is considered to amount to legal treatment uh, as affirmed in the case of Marmitas versus Uruguay before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. So and also, so just assuming that it's in effect that uh, Ms. Drogo decided not to file the application for stay of the execution of the house. What would your argument be? Can you clarify your question, please? So you said that uh, it's not in effect that about any stay application, right? Uh, but assuming it's in effect that she could have filed a stay but she did not, uh -huh. what would your argument be? Can I have 30 seconds? Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so if I'm understanding your question correctly, uh, if she had to pay, uh, if the effect takes a is that your question? No, if she could have filed a stay. If she could have filed a stay. Filed a stay, stay. stay. In court. Oh. A stay of the cost spending Supreme Court, and she chose not to, what would be your argument? Um, in this regard, uh, we must uh, consess on this point that, uh, as we do take note, that every financial cost of individual must be taken into account, um, as affirmed uh, in the African Legal Aid Forces in Nigeria, that uh, there was a minor that who had uh, a financial aid from a non-government organization to submit to the court, and then by the court had said that uh, it is a, um, it's not considered even effective in this case. And in that regard, we must consist. Um, and, uh, and, um, and this concludes this submission. Um, rebuttal for now. Thank you. Thank you so much.
the Moroccan judicial system does not fall under the scope of the definition of course of success. Referring to the TK versus France in 1989, MK versus France in 1989, given by European University Institute, the, U the court concluded that the appellant has no prospect of success due to the fact that the legal proceedings the appellant faced were done in language that is not is the language that is not the appellant's mother tongue. Regarding this case, the speed by which trial was conducted and judgment rendered cannot be used to discredit the decision and to use the same as evidence to prove the lack of prospect of success. Unlike in the case referred to by the appellant, the legal proceedings of Milwaukee were held in the appellant's mother tongue. What is more, again, the courts of Milwaukee are formed from very qualified judges and have considered a number of elements during the deliberation, which may cause differences in the in period of the deliberating time. In the interest of justice and to avoid using the court's limited resources on cases for no purpose, a speedy disposition of cases are well within reason. It's all part of this one. Uh, one question. Uh, what, is your, what is your answer to the fact that uh, the leader of <coughs> the Orange Church uh, was arrested because of the assembly? Legal assembly, but the leader of the Indigo movement, or no one from the Indigo movement, was arrested because they are more uh, partisan to the leading uh, central government. What do you want to do? Um, to show that the arrest of uh, Diana Drogo was political. Um, I'll make my question then. Um, the, the only only person who was arrested was that. And I think a few, uh, a few orange shirts, but not from the Indigo movement. So pe people may infer that the arrest of Diana Drogo was political.
requiring an exhaustion of domestic remedies. And secondly, the appellant submits that Mawaki has breached Article 2 of the UN Convention Against Torture, while my co-counsel Evelyn will be submitting that Mawaki has violated Diana's freedom of assembly and freedom of movement. So moving on to my first submission, that all of Diana's claims are admissible because they fall under an exception to Article 7. Article 7 governs the jurisdiction of this court and states that all domestic remedies need to be exhausted before a claim can be brought to the searcher court. Article 7.2 then lays down the exceptions to this requirement, which are first, where there is no due process of law, the second, where the party was denied access to domestic remedies, and third, where there was unwarranted delay in rendering a final judgment. We submit that all of Diana's claims are admissible because they fall under the exceptions in Article 72A and B. Both the torture and assembly claim are admissible for a lack of due process, which satisfies the exception under 72A. While the travel ban claim is admissible as well because Diana was denied access to domestic remedies, which satisfies the exception under 72B. So A is for the torture claim and the freedom of assembly claim. And then I'll be submitting for B, the travel ban claim is also admissible. And so B. And then for B, the travel ban claim. Yes, thank you, Your Excellency. So the torture claim is admissible for a lack of due process. So what does this mean? The Inter-American Court of Human Rights has interpreted this to mean that the claim must have no reasonable prospect of success. So in the present case, Making Diana launch a new claim in torture at the domestic courts doesn't have any reasonable prospect of success. This is because the Supreme Court has already found that the conditions of detention did not amount to torture. So that is the apex court in that country? Yes, Your Excellency. Given that the Supreme Court is the final appellate court and that it has authoritatively proved that her conditions of detention did not amount to torture, that it would be simply futile to ask her to bring a new claim in torture. And hence, this proves that the domestic courts have failed to afford her due process of law, and thus, she should not be strictly required to exhaust all domestic remedies. But I thought you just said that she had already exhausted all of her remedies uh, with respect to torture, right? Yes. The Supreme Court has already decided to oh. that to okay. give it? Yes, Your Excellency, what I was submitting was that perhaps uh, uh, the respondent might argue that the claim, the complainant has not brought a new claim in torture. However, we submit that because she has already uh, that, that uh, be a new claim in torture? Uh, because the uh, the respondent might argue that she has not brought a substantive complaint in torture alone, but she has brought up a torture claim through the habeas corpus application, and so it might not be so direct. And Tans, Hawaki will provide clothing for the And second, also that Diana is Christian guilty for this movement. In governing the application of pre-trial detention by states often lead to the failure of the presumption of innocent staff. In accordance with new article on the special rapporteur by Harold van Bovenbaard of the people, the obtained judicial warrant of pre-trial detention as international norm, criminal suspects are held in police cells first for not more than 48 hours until their first court appearance and thereafter transferred to a prison or pre-trial detention center. However, in this case, your sources, Diana is directly detained and operated in solitary confinement <coughs> for 20, day, 20 days consecutively without being held in a police house and her first appearance in trial. And your sources? Uh, wait, well, what case are you using to, to justify this stuff? Did you refer to the UN report of the Special Report of the And it said that if? Uh, to obtain judicial warrant of pre-trial detention, mm -hmm. uh, criminal suspects are held first in the police house for not, not more than 48 hours. But does that report say that if the local courts, if the local courts uh, do not, you know, abide with the innocent local human liberty principle, you can then appeal to a human court, uh, sorry, to a human rights court? That, you sorry, sorry, let me rephrase that. The, your, like, your argument just now yes. was based on the UN report, right? Yes. Did that UN report say that if any court were to treat their um, uh, 
person in the way that in the way that Diana treated, it means that you can be it means you can, we can appeal that case to a human rights court. Uh, which line? Which line is the report? Angel, submit this case to this court uh, in order to be the solicitation for the human rights treaty of this family. Oh, the treaty. Which part of the treaty? Uh, Article 7, Section 1. Article 7, Subsection 1 of the treaty says that. Can you please verify that for me? Yes. Uh, Admission by the solicitation for human rights of tradition or communication law shall be subject to the following requirements and Diana has fulfilled the requirements of the Therefore, agent will have to submit this case. No, but case. how does that relate to the innocence of the proven guilty? Oh, proven guilty. Yeah, because that's what you're saying here, right? Yeah, so I want to know. So you please, correct me if I'm wrong. Because I'm just stuck on this point. You're saying that Diana was not subject to the principle of innocence of the proven guilty, right? By the Marwaki courts, correct? And because of that, we have the jurisdiction to hear that case, right? Now, I just want to know what law says that. What law says that, what report says that if the local courts did not grant the, the, the person um, the right of, or like, you know, by the principle of incident and guilty, you can appeal that case to a human rights court, to a human rights panel. Oh. Uh, did you like to refer to the case Case of Palas Pastor Rico expresses Honduras. Okay. And what did that case say? Uh, is this in your memoir? Uh, yes. Okay, go on. Go on, yeah. Paragraph 19. It okay. will say that um, the exception of exception of local remedies are necessary to protect the individual uh, there because the state itself has control over domestic remedies. Mm. Uh, without the exception of the rule, there could be a danger of abuse. It must be, it right. must be born in the mind that international protection of human rights is founded on the need to protect the victim from the arbitrary exercise of the government, governmental authority. Therefore, international courts must be right to adjudicate the human rights under those cases. And it says that in the, the case is that uh, the international, sorry, the case says that international human rights courts have jurisdiction if that, if that happens. The case uh, is that like it says that. You concluded. You only yes. But did they, but the, did the case expressly say that? Uh, no, it It only say that uh, international protection of human rights is founded on the need to protect the victim from the everyday exercise of government. All right. Okay. Okay. Go on. And um, third, your reason is that yeah. Diana is not notified justifiably of charges relating to in accordance with the International Covenant of Civil Order Rights, or ICCPR Article 14, Section 3A, as the minimum guarantee, everyone shall be entitled to be informed formally of charge against her. In this case, also, sis, due to the sudden arrest of Diana by the police during the rally, Diana is not given information of the time and place, of the nature and the cause of the offense she was alleged. As the second round of sis, that the state of Malawi has also failed the standards of warranted limits on foreign grounds. First one, the case should be categorized as non compact matter. Second, Diana did not conduct war of the father, was subjected to solitary confinement in a 5 by 5 meter cell for 20 days. The authorities know that he has no By the way, the authorities are not aware that he has a no However, it has been held by most highly qualified. It's not necessary that the authorities be informed of the situation of the victim. Moreover, honored members of the court, it can be seen that in such solitary confinement, she was also left in the room where the lights were turned on for 24 hours a day, making it very difficult for a person to sleep. Thus, depriving the appellant of rest. And it has been held by a special rapporteur, Juan Mendes, that any solitary confinement in itself, in excess of 15 days, may constitute torture because of the psychological effects these may have on the victim. And in addition to this, even special rapporteur, Peter Koichnas, agrees that if there is excessive light in such situation, it may also lead to torture. 
Moreover, the case of Israel regarding the legality of the general service system held that sleep deprivation in itself may also constitute torture. However, this applicant would like to submit that it is not only paragraph 24, wherein there was infliction of severe suffering. However, even in paragraph 23, where in such situation of being deprived of rest, the applicant was then subjected to 12 hours of interrogation, once again every day, once again for 20 days. And during such interrogations, on the members of the court, she would be issued threats of corporal punishment, of life imprisonment, and it did not even stop with threats against herself. But they even crossed the line that must not be crossed. Respondents started, started rather issuing threats not only to the appellant, but even to appellant's family members. Even showing the appellant photos of her family members to further deepen the scar, to further create this imminence of fear. And it has been held by the United Nations Voluntary Fund for Victims of Torture that threats issued to oneself and threats issued to one's family members may constitute torture. And this is also elucidated in the case of the, the, uh, and the, the on the Article 21, restrictions are not valid unless the, they are in con, for, uh, conformity with the law and are necessary uh, for a uh, legitimate interest include the national uh, security, public order, and the public uh, uh, safety. A necessary uh, question is to that name. And uh, uh, in that, uh, in the uh, Justice Holmes uh, case law, and uh, he uh, is that the principle that only the matter was clear and the uh, present danger that can uh, apply for the restriction was to prohibit the freedom of uh, um, and the uh, uh, power, power to uh, power to has been wrongly um, contained and the rallies in power in power to get the support for the autonomy and the independence for the past ten years. And uh, uh, in the past ten years, even though on the um, on the 10th February uh, 2016, the rally in Assembly. The Harvard, uh, the Harvard uh, 2.0 had never spread messages with to urge Harvardians to bring workers uh, to defend the, themselves against the imminent crackdown by the American uh, states. And the government had uh, no obvious evidence to prove that uh, uh, to prove that the, rest of the messengers were exposed by the end up. And so, uh, uh, and uh, we can just imagine that uh, if the Diana urged people to bring some weapons, that their uh, political people would be far, would be far exceed. Um, certainly, Malarkey has a positive obligation to continually um, protect and uh, facilitate uh, peaceful assemblies, which it has built to forbid. For uh, instead, Malarkey prohibited both rallies uh, ahead of time and even developed uh, armed tanks to destroy the Armenian uh, ground, which could uh, cause serious uh, injuries and, uh, and deaths. Uh, of course, the some features is uh, Malarkey. Uh, Malarkey violated the land of freedom of uh, movement on the article on the article throughout the ICCPR. Um, firstly, the cover ban on Diana is inconsistent with the other rights recognized in the ICCPR. Uh, according to the article 12, paragraph 1 and paragraph 2 of the ICCPR, everyone properly is in the territory of the state shore. We see that uh, territory have the right to liberty of the movement and the freedom to choose his uh, residence. Uh, everyone should be free to leave any country, including his own. Including his own. And uh, 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 secondly, the, in, the import, imposition of the common man had no legal, had no legal uh, basis. Uh, 
from our common heritage as human rights, rooted in a simple fact that every civilization was built through cooperation and collaboration. By human nature, people come together, collectively pursue their interests, and vibrant assembly and association rights are essential not only for the legitimate democracy, but also for just society. Article 21 of the FCCPR is one of the vital provisions that protect such human existence. The right of peaceful assembly shall be recognized. In the case at hand, the rally on the 10th of February was expected to be peaceful, and it was. There was no reports of violence. No evidence in the facts of the case indicates that any of the participants of the Harbor 2.0 would incite or resort to violence. In the Barankovich vs. Russia in 2017, the European Court of Human Rights held that Article 11 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which is comparable to Article 21 of the CCPR, should be interpreted to require a state's duty to take reasonable and appropriate measures to enable lawful demonstrations to proceed peacefully. However, the respondent refused to take any measure for the rally on the 10th of February to proceed peacefully, but rather banned the rally based on no substantive grounds. We acknowledge that Article 21 of ICCPR allows restrictions on the right of peaceful assembly in exceptional circumstances. The wording of the restriction in Article 21 of ICCPR begins with no restrictions may be placed on the exercise of the right of peaceful assembly other than circumstances provided in the same article. Thus, restrictions may be placed in those limited circumstances only. First, restrictions should be imposed in conformity with the law. Second, they serve the interest of national security, public safety, public order, or other reasons stated. And third, they should be necessary in democratic society. First, banning the rally based on the peace of the public act does not and should not satisfy the requirement of imposed in conformity with the law. The law here in Article 21 of SCPR is not meant to include any type of law, especially those that has the potential of violating human rights. The Syracuse principles on the limitation and derogation provisions in the SCPR provides that the laws imposing limitations on the exercise of human rights shall not be arbitrary or unreasonable, while such rules shall be clear and accessible to everyone. However, as one of the human rights NGOs in Marwaki clearly indicated, wording in the face of the public health is both ambiguous and open to abuse, often justifying authorities to disband protests and arrest individuals for detention without no without providing grounds. Such a rules that the minister may at any time declare a rally is illegal and use whatever means to disband rally goes beyond the state's limitations on the exercise of right of peaceful assembly. In the case of Brazil versus Ukraine in 2013, the European Court of Human Rights also held that the law and the limitation of the right of peaceful assembly does not only require state measures to have a basis in domestic law, but also refers to the quality of the law. In this case, the court emphasized foreseeability of the domestic law. The law should be formulated with sufficient precision to enable persons to foresee to a degree that is reasonable in circumstances, the consequences with a given action may entail. participating in that protest only wants to advocate their message to the peace and they did not 
providing any sort of opportunity for the participants to exercise their right. And alternatives does not alternatives can be in terms of time or even space because they should have provided or they should have provided a public space for these people to exercise their right to peaceful assembly. And yes, we also can say with the fact that there is a presence of counter rally that may incite a disturbance to the public order. But this is where the role of law enforcement in, in uh, the role of law enforcement and the way public authorities manage this event becomes crucial. Or it should, it can actually, by providing alternatives, for, for example, like the segregated both bodies in a different time or <coughs> in, a, in, a, in a different time or space, they could have they could have avoid any potential violence that may occur between those two opposite organizations. The position of the government is
security of the state of the world. With that, I shall begin with the grounds of submission for the respondent. The respondent respectfully submits that first, the appellant did not exhaust all of the remedies. Second, the respondent did not commit any acts of torture towards the appellant. If I may begin with the first round of submission, my lord. The first round of submission is further divided into two days. First, the appellant did not appeal to the Supreme Court of Milwaukee in regards to the appellant's right to travel and right to assembly. Second, the appellant did not pursue the proper remedies in regards to her alleged torture. I shall now begin with the first claim of submission, whereby the appellant did not appeal to the Supreme Court of Milwaukee in regards to her rights. The rule on exhaustion of local remedies is expressly provided in Article 41, Clause 1, Paragraph C of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which reads that local remedies must be pursued and exhausted before a claim can be admissible to international courts. Is it all local remedies or only reliable local remedies? Yes, my lord. There are exceptions that are provided in Article 7, Clause 2A of the Southeast Asian Court of Human Rights Treaty of Wisconsin. And this is why the respondent would like to pretend that those remedies contained in Article 7, Clause 2, does not apply to the appellant. Therefore, I shall begin with the first claim. In Article, I beg your pardon, in Paragraph 43, if I may direct the court's attention to Paragraph 43 of the facts of the case. As mentioned, Article 7, Clause 2, A and B provides exceptions where an appellant does not have to exhaust local remedies. First, is when there was no due process at all. My lords, in the case of Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which is the case of Valen v. Rodriguez, decided in 1980, the court has defined due process of law as a remedy which is unavoidable, ineffective, and inadequate. And the respondent would like to contend on these same exceptions. Counsel, for the clarity of the court, repeat the fact for the due process of law. Yes, my lord. Due process of law, according to the case of Valen v. Rodriguez, is when an appellant could proceed in his own state on a remedy that is available, a remedy is adequate, and a remedy is effective. Is it about natural justice? My lord, to address the issue of natural justice, that would fall under the first exception, which is a remedy is available. And according to the case of NPP Rulo and Dupree, which is a 2005 European Court of Human Rights, it states that mere allegations on the judiciary, the non-independence of the judiciary, could not be substantiated, and the claims must still be brought to the apex court of the land. Thus, local remedies must still be exhausted and pursued by court. If I may proceed with my submission. Secondly, my lord, due to the fact that the appellant's state counsel had contended that there was no independence in the judiciary system of the state of Hawaii, thus, the appellant does not have to exhaust local remedies. If I may direct the court's attention to paragraph 4, to the supplement of the moot problem. In paragraph 4, it states that the judges in the state of Hawaii are elected by a special judicial commission, comprising of members of the bar, members of eminent acquisitions, and former judges. Thus, mere allegations... Who appoints this commission? This commission is appointed and selected and promoted by the Chief Justice, former Supreme Court judges, the Attorney General, eminent acquisitions, and members of the bar. Therefore, mere allegations by the appellant, as we see in paragraph 58 of the facts of the case, which states that the reason why they did not appeal to the Supreme Court of Milwaukee due to the non-independence of the judiciary system could not be substantiated as reiterated in the case of MPG Google and its case reports. The second contention made by the appellant's state counsel is that there is no due process of law due to the fact that there was a hasty dismissal of the courts as could be seen in paragraph 55 of the facts of the case. However, my lord, that forms under the third remedy, which is a remedy is considered to be inadequate. And in the case of Malas and Nicaragua, which is an inter-American court of human rights case, specifically in paragraph 188... Could you state the facts of the case? Yes, my lord. In that case, it concerns the right of the appellant's fair trial. And in that case, the court took five years to reject the appellant's claim. And the court held that it was 
God took a long time to reject the plan of state. However, my lords, if I may direct the court's attention to paragraph 34 and 35 of the facts of the case. In paragraph 34 and 35 of the facts of the case, the, the judiciary system in Milwaukee in regards to the travel ban took five months to decide the matter. And in regards to the
working uh, with the foundation to this. Okay, so um, have I missed out everything you went to say? Uh, I know, I, I don't want to be, to be the person to stand between you and your dinner. <laughs> That'd be quite foolish. So, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna let's start the more. Uh, I mean, we have, can we allow the the academics, the guests, the trustees, uh, and the judges, like our guest judges, to go first because this is the buffet, uh, and then only the students go. Uh, I hope you want to do that. Can we, can we begin? Team 
team 103, team 106, team 108, and team 101. So the matchup for tomorrow will be team 103 against team 108. And the sec the second uh, the, uh, the other session will be team 106 against team 101. So uh, my, my, according to usually in more, uh, more competitions, the teams with the high, higher rank will be able to call call on which side they will pick on the coin toss. So team 103 and team 108. So team 103 is ranked higher as to team 108. So team 103 from the US would, uh, would have to call on whether they would pick hit something else first. Thank you. 